How can you tell if you're really progressing in your intimacy journey? This episode will give you markers and tools to figure out your own answer to this really important question. So stay tuned to the Deeper Dating Podcast. If you've ever been disillusioned, disappointed, or discouraged in your search for love, and you know there has to be a better way to find the healthy, soul-filling love you've always longed for, then you've discovered the podcast for you. I know, as Ken's work personally has led me to find the love of my life. So here's your host of Deeper Dating, Ken Page. Hello, and welcome to the Deeper Dating Podcast. I'm Ken Page, and I'm a psychotherapist, author of the book Deeper Dating, and the host of this podcast. And today, I'm going to be talking about how you can know if you are progressing in your intimacy journey. This week and every week, I'm going to share with you the greatest tools that I know to help you find love and grow love and heal your life in the process because the skills of dating are nothing more than the skills of love. And we know that those are the most important skills of all for a happy, meaningful life. And if you want to know more about the Deeper Dating Path to Real Intimacy, just go to deeperdatingpodcast.com. You can sign up for my mailing list and get free gifts and also get complete transcripts of every episode. Also, we have created an online event for people to meet based on the deeper values and skills that we talk about in this program. It's warm, it's emotionally safe, it's fun, and it's positive. So just go to deeperdating.com. That's deeperdating.com to learn more about that and to sign up if you like. Also, I just want to say that everything I share in this podcast is educational in nature, and it's not medical or psychiatric advice. So if you're having any serious psychological symptoms, please seek professional help. And if you like what you're learning here, thank you so much for subscribing and leaving me a review. So let's jump right in. So many of you that are listening have committed to a journey of growth in your search for love. And this is such a big, big thing because we're taught that somehow we should like have this it, which means attractiveness, which means success in dating, which means success in finding love. And I guess some of us do have that, but the rest of us have to do some real work to rewire and shift and grow and take a kind of wisdom path to learn about how we push love away and how we can invite love in. And those learnings are some of the most beautiful and strengthening learnings that we can have in our life. So I consider this holy ground. I consider it sacred ground. I consider it just some of the most precious and important learning that can exist. And so many of you have chosen your own path where you are exploring what does it mean to grow as a person who knows how to love? What does it mean to grow as a person who's looking for love and who this time is really looking for healthy, real, sustainable, beautiful love? What does it mean to be someone who sees our clay feet in love and is humbled by that realization of the ways that we miss signals, push people away, go numb, do unkind things? Those of us who are humbled by those things and say, I want to change them, well, that's why we're here. And so when we start learning new skills and new insights, like I hope that for you, this podcast is filled with insights that feel like wisdom and feel like possibility for you, feel like an invitation to you really tackling the climb of your own intimacy journey. So having that experience is a wonderful, wonderful thing. It's exciting. It gives a feeling of hope. And it moves us away from that relentless and ugly current that tells us, oh no, it's that we're not acting masculine enough or feminine enough, or we're not flirting right, or it's the issues our hair, or it's our weight, or it's our glutes. 
or it's that we just don't act cool enough, or we just don't have these pickup skills, all this crap that actually steers us away from love and toward self-loathing in a very indirect and strange circular path. A little bit more about that. When we decide to take that path, the path of fixing ourselves and fixing our packaging, when that becomes, and I'm all for looking good, I'm all for feeling confident and expressing that, I'm all for the joy of fun flirting, I'm all for all of those things. What I'm not for is putting the packaging improvement first because that's a soul killer that weakens us and it does something else too. A really strange thing it does is when we take that path, how can I fix myself? How can I make myself more attractive? How am I not attractive enough? Because that must be why I'm not in a relationship. And God knows I spent decades, decades and decades and decades seduced by that. So when we do that, we end up being sexually and romantically attracted to people who are not going to be available. Now, this is kind of a mystical thing to me. It's something I talk about a lot. And in my work with clients and in my intensives, I see that as people learn to value and treasure their core gifts, their attractions actually begin to change. And I've seen this in my own life too. When we start by honoring who we are and learning to honor who the other person is, when we honor our sense of discrimination, those are the things that really matter. Those are the things that work. Those are the things wherein our search for love becomes our discovery of self-love and they join together. And in that happening, that's when we learn the real skills of intimacy, which are not, how can I change myself and airbrush myself so I'm more attractive, but who am I really Who is the other person really? How can I be real? How can I treasure them? How can I treasure me? How can we honor each other? How can I say what's real for me? When we do that, when we do those things, our search for love unequivocally, absolutely, fundamentally changes. And that's a hard work miracle, but it really happens. So these are the great things that happen when we take on a conscious path to looking for love. But it sounds simple from here, from this like very kind of like high aerial view. It's kind of like, I've talked about this, it's kind of like looking at a map and an inch equals 300 miles. So fine, I just go from here to there. It's really easy. And the map is right. That's true. It tells you just where to go. But when you're actually there on ground following that, you realize that a road is closed because of a detour. Another road is closed because of a flood. Another road you don't want to go down because it's really, really unpleasant and there's a much more interesting road somewhere else. So the real path, these these concepts that I'm saying are absolutely true, but on the ground, it's still hard. It's still murky. It's still confusing. And that period where we're looking for love and we're learning to live these changes, there's still this period where it's like, well, what's going on? When is it going to happen? When am I going to see the difference? When am I going to meet someone who's not almost? Because on this journey, I think what many people experience as they learn these lessons that we talk about here the kind of people they meet change. But it's like a stepping stone thing. And very often, the kind of people you meet as you begin this journey or you dive into the earlier stages of this journey are better than the people you were meeting. And you're attracted and you're interested and you say, oh, this feels really different. I get it. And then you sometimes end up saying, oh, no, it's just not close enough. They still have so many of those old traits and they're not working on them. They're not addressing them. Something like that. And that's because it's a kind of stepping stone process. So this middle process is hard. And when you enter into a tunnel, you've got the light from behind you. When you're coming out of a tunnel, you see the light at the end of the tunnel. 
But in the middle of the tunnel, how do you find the light? How do you find the light? How do you find the hope when you feel like it's like a slogging journey, when it's just so damn exhausting to try again or deflating to meet another almost person? How do you get through that? Well, I'm going to talk about a few different ways. And the first way that I want to talk about is this. A client once said to me, and I love this, I thought it was so wise. He, he came in and he said, you know, I realize that no matter where I am, no matter what challenges I'm going through, the first question is always going to be the same. The acknowledgement of and gratitude for what you have already and of how far you've come. The act of looking back from where you've been and seeing where you are and seeing the arc of progress incomplete still, but seeing that, that looking back and saying, oh yeah, that's where I came from, and acknowledging the growth is a huge, huge and important tool. And we're going to do that together because I'm going to ask you five questions. And these five questions, as you answer them, you will notice the ways in which maybe you might be still stuck in your journey, or you'll be able to acknowledge ways that you really are progressing in your journey. Then following that, I'm going to talk about some, if you're feeling not like you're progressing, but like you're stuck. I'm going to give you a few questions to help you think about why you might be stuck, where there might need to be some kind of intervention, some kind of tinkering, some kind of shift, so that you're free again to continue moving forward. But let's start with these fabulous questions. So I want you to think about each one and you can answer it out loud or write it down if you like. Okay, good. So the first question is, in your journey, are you coming to understand and value your authentic self, your gifts, your passions, and your sensitivities more deeply? Just take a minute. Are you, and and think about that, do you feel like you understand and value your innate gifts, your deep sensitivities and passions more fully, as opposed to thinking, oh, this is going to be too much. I'm going to get in trouble for this. No one's going to be romantically attracted to this. It's too different. It's too weird. It's too whatever. Or are you coming to treasure those parts and say, this is really who I am? Take a minute and think about that. If your answer is yes, then that is truly, truly something to cheer, and it is something that will unequivocally shift the creation of the fabric of your future. It will shift the patterns of your future, and in good and important ways. Next question. You know, I talk about two different kinds of circuitries of attraction. Attractions of deprivation and attractions of inspiration. That was the piece of my deeper dating book that Oprah.com excerpted the ability to kind of tell the difference. And attractions of deprivation are attractions where the attraction is at least in part trying to get the other person to finally be available to finally do their part of the work, to finally treat you kindly and with dignity and respect. And there's this passion of that because they're almost there, but they're not there. And we can get lost in that forever. Those are attractions of deprivation. Attractions of inspiration are when we become sexually and romantically attracted to somebody because of his or her or their goodness, solidity, integrity, capacity, decency, availability, generosity of spirit, all those wonderful things. When we become sexually and romantically attracted to someone because of their goodness and their solidity, when that's woven in, we're making the right choices. We are finally making the choices that are going to lead to a love-filled future. And it's a big, big choice point. So that's another question. Are you losing your taste for your attractions of deprivation and getting away from them more quickly? If so, that is something else to celebrate. So here's the next question. Are you increasingly following your attractions of inspiration? Are you noticing people like that more? Are you more interested in them? Are you spending more time with them? I know for me, attractions of inspiration used to seem boring. 
I love that spicy edge of an unavailable person. And as I grew, I came to realize that that's actually, there's a wonderful ancient Hindu saying that goes something like that what we used to think was honey, we realize is poison. And what we used to think is poison turns out to be honey. And I know for me, I thought attractions of inspiration were the most boring thing that existed. And I hated that I thought that because I knew that was going to get me in trouble. But I still thought it and I felt it. And as I began to love attractions of inspiration more, my world changed. Truly, truly, truly. So the next question, are you being yourself more in your relationships? And there's this wonderful saying, which is, say what you mean, mean what you say, but don't say it mean. That's from kind of the world of 12-step wisdom. So are you expressing your authentic self more fully in your relationships? If your answer to that is yes, this is also wonderful. If you are doing those things, you are moving closer toward the healthy love you dream of. These things are light in the middle of the tunnel. And next, are you adding to this recipe of growth a nice dollop of bravery? Getting out there virtually or in person, uh, these days more virtually, to meet new people. And always, 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 I say this, virtual uh, venues or in-person venues with people who share your passions and interests and values are probably the best place to meet. And so if you're online, you can filter people's profiles by those very things. So every question you answered yes to is cause for celebration. And if you answered yes to at least two of those questions, the chances are good that your dating life is changing in significant ways. And it is, if you're saying yes to more of those, maybe three of those or four, it is really possible that kind of almost mysteriously, you are meeting kinder and more available people and you're more interested in them. So trust the path you're working because it's working. Now, if you honestly, though, feel that there are no significant changes occurring for you as a result of this kind of inner work that you're doing, there's a few questions I'd like you to ask. And usually, at least one of them is going to hold the key to explaining your stuck point. Number one, are you in an actively abusive relationship of any sort? If you are, not only will you be being abused and hurt, which is just so profoundly depleting, diminishing, wounding, and traumatizing, there's a secondary problem too. There's a secondary kind of huge costs that come with these relationships. And that is that the deep down belief that you somehow don't deserve better gets reinforced every day you're in this relationship, gets reinforced every time you feel diminished by this person. So in an abusive relationship, if it's physically abusive, if it's seriously emotionally abusive, get help to help get out. Don't just get out because sometimes that could be really dangerous unless you absolutely need to for health and safety reasons, then just get out. But if you can get help in doing it, you will protect yourself in the process. And in those less extreme cases where someone, like I know somebody who um, has been in a relationship for a gazillion years, and so her wife can be sharp-tongued, and she hates it. My friend hates that. So they have a deal. They've done this for a lot of years. Every time the wife is sharp-tongued, she has to give my friend 25 cents. You know, no serious amount of money, but they love each other. And, and you know, as sharp-tongued as her wife is, she's a wonderful person and loves her. So um, this works for them. I love that story. So if you're in a relationship where the abuse is not extreme, then that's what needs to be worked on because it's not okay for you to end up feeling diminished. Next question, do you have any untreated psychiatric disorders or any active addictions? And when I say untreated psychiatric disorders, I don't mean mild depression or anxiety or even somewhat strong, well, 
Yeah, I don't mean mild depression, mild anxiety. I mean depression, anxiety, or other psychiatric conditions that really destabilize you in regular ways, where in w- for which you are either untreated or undertreated. You have not found a treatment that stabilizes you, or you have an active addiction. If those things are true, none of this stuff is going to really work or stick except to help get you into treatment at best. But a relationship won't be able to work until you address this. So stop and do that. Make that commitment because ain't nothing going to work until you do. And there'll be so much pain in not doing it and such a sense of mastery in really tackling and addressing these things. So we take a big breath in that one, everyone. Another one is, are you doing this work alone without a learning partner or support? Because if so, it's much, much harder. And I would encourage all of you to find a learning partner, somebody who will work with you and be with you as you learn your lessons of intimacy day by day and date by date, who can listen, who can support you, who can guide you in a way that's not critical but is warm and caring. I can't tell you um, how important that is, but the research backs it up 100%. I actually did a whole episode on this subject. Another one is, are you really resisting putting your heart into this work? That's just something to think about. In other words, really doing it with gusto, really diving in to your intimacy lessons. And I want to say it's not easy because it's very humbling to say, oh, damn, I really see that I'm pushing love away. I am really seeing my clay feet in this relationship or in my the ways that I date. But this is one of the greatest things that we can give ourselves is that humbling acknowledgement because when that happens, we change. And when that doesn't happen, we feel ashamed and resistant to change. And the last one I want to say is, is there another issue like an old relationship you haven't been able to let go of that's blocking your progress? So if any of these things are going on, I want to really encourage you to take the brave step of getting support. Because if you're stuck here, don't try to fix it alone because your efforts will be so much more weakened. Willpower in cases where we're trying to change personality patterns. Willpower is one of the weakest tools in the toolbox. Support is the most powerful. So that's just a thought that I want to share with you. So I just want to say in closing that in this phase, you might feel like you're stuck at some of the old, familiar, creepy, sad, frustrating crossroads that you've been at before in your dating life. And sometimes it might even feel like nothing's different, but things are different. Because if you look more closely, you'll see that you are coming to those old crossroads with a new set of tools, with a stronger sense of connection to your own gifts, and hopefully with more support. And at every crossroad, especially with support, you'll notice that you're making new micro shifts in your approach that have a little bit more self-love, a little bit more self-dignifying, a little bit more passion and power and self-honoring, or a little more kindness. And you'll notice these micro-shifts, and those micro-shifts open new doors. And when new doors open, that means that a new future is actually being formed and shaped and sculpted. And you'll sense that something new is happening, because you'll feel glimmers of intimacy at points that once just felt like closed doors. So take a minute to think about which of these ideas hits you the most now, is the most useful, is the most feeling like a guidepost for you. And I encourage you to hold that to your heart and do something constructive and creative with it. Thank you so much for listening, and I hope this was useful, and I so look forward to seeing you on the next episode of the Deeper Dating Podcast. And that's it for today's episode of Deeper Dating. Be sure to go to deeperdatingpodcast.com as Ken has a few more gifts for you. Then join us on the next episode.